So, Jen, can can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, wonderful, wonderful, great. So, good morning, everyone. Welcome back to our e-seminar series uh, on transitional biomedical engineering. It's a, a great pleasure for me to uh, host uh, Professor Jiang Yu Li uh, from McGill University today. He is, uh, he is an old friend of mine and also a wonderful researcher which, uh, whose research uh, is, is fantastic and is going to talk about some of the work that he's uh, doing on uh, uh, emerging bioadhesive technologies that he's developing is in his lab. Uh, but before we start, and, and as usual, if uh, you have any questions during the talk, please make sure that you use the ask a question box so we can follow uh, your uh, question and, and then ask them from, from our speaker. Uh, also, there is a, 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 a box underneath that of this, uh, your, your screen that you can, at the bottom of your screen that you can click and then subscribe to our uh, YouTube channel. Uh, you can watch many, many videos that uh, from our speakers, previous speakers and now on your, our YouTube channel. Make sure that you subscribe and, and, and enjoy these, these uh, basically uh, talks. Our next speaker is Professor Jared uh, Cherko. Uh, from University of Arizona, and uh, he will be talking about some of his uh, translational work in the area of cardiovascular uh, tissue uh, regeneration and tissue engineering. Uh, last but not least, uh, I'd like to thank our sp uh, sponsor, uh, Montreal Transmed Tech Institute, who has been with us since almost the beginning of these e-seminar series. Thank you very much, Montreal Transmed Tech, for your uh, support. Uh, also, if you have any questions regarding this seminar series, or if you have any feedback that you wanted to share with us, make sure that feel free to uh, to contact me or Professor Savoji from University of Montreal uh, via email or uh, uh, through our uh, LinkedIn channel or or, uh, or uh, our Twitter. Uh, so, with that, I'd like now to uh, invite. Invite our uh, speaker, uh, Professor Jiang Yu Li, who is a Canada researcher in biomaterials and musculoskeletal health. Uh, he is also an assistant professor in the Department of Mechanical Engineering and associate member in the Department of Biomedical Engineering and, uh, and Surgery, both at McGill University. Uh, he obtained his PhD degree in mechanical engineering from Harvard University and conducted a postdoctoral research in biomaterials at the Harvard Risk Institute, uh, the same institute that I, uh, I also uh, did my postdoc. Um, he his current research is focused on the design and mechanics of uh, biomaterials for tissue repair applications. Uh, Dr. Lee received several different awards, uh, including the Christoph Peer Research Excellence Award uh, from McGill University, the WIS Technology Development Award from Harvard University and is listed in, in Innovators Under 35 China by MIT Technology Review. This is, this, is, uh, this is a very prestigious recognition. His work has been covered by the New England Journal of Medicine uh, and many news outlets such as the BBC, the CBC and uh, so on and so forth. So uh, thank you very much, Professor Lee, for accepting um, our invitation. And uh, the virtual floor is now yours. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, I'm super glad to have this opportunity to present. And thank you again for the invitation. Uh, I'm Jian Yu Li. Uh, I'm at McGill. So today I would like to introduce some of our work on bioadhesive technologies. So is anyone see like on screen well? Yes, yes. Okay. Okay, first of all, I'd like to acknowledge uh, that my team at McGill, and also I have a wonderful collaborator uh, in the state in Canada. I also like to sub acknowledge the funding support, uh, what uh, enable our research at McGill. So the focus of my talk is on biodiesel. I think you probably already met this kind of material uh, in your life. Right, the most common bioadhesive are uh, cyanoacrylate. So the medical grade of cyanoacrylate, known as like a uh, thermal bond, uh, has been kind of used kind of in a clinic. There are many other bioadhesives available in the market, and many of them are based on hydrogels. 
right? So such as the CoCO1 from Baxter are made of the PEG hydrogel, like the TCL, and there are some other kind of uh, different generation based on the fibrin, or uh, lubin, or a different kind of like protein polymer. And the bioheat market has been increased a lot. So the current market size just like reported in somewhere is like at least reached like 1.8 billion per year. So clear is a very, very significant use. Uh, it's a very, very interesting market. And why it is important, right? There are a lot of clinical need for biofeeds here, right? Most of them are related to the tissue repair application. And here in this slide, I just showcase some of those applications. Right, we need biofeeds such as this dermal bone sun activate to manage the skin wound. And there are other cases, right, in, such as the dermal repair, and you need this biofeedsive to repair the internal organ or tissues. And there are some other emerging applications that are using biofeedsive to attach the implantable devices. For example, like in this case, is a uh, electronics attached to a heart. And there are significant use of the biofeedsive potentially for the anastomosis. You may know that anastomosis is a very, very important surgical procedure, and that is initially like also proposed by Alex Carrell. So actually, that win him a Nobel Prize in 1912. And this kind of surgical procedure currently is mainly based on the sutures, uh, this kind of like material, and it's so important for many different kinds of surgery, including these organ transplantations. Right. Currently, there are more than 150,000 cases of organ transplantation. And as you can appreciate, right, in those kind of surgery, uh, as the, the most is very important. And presumably, in the future, this biology can be used to replace the use of the suture in all those kind of applications. So here, I'd like to provide a big picture of the history of the biology uh, Bioadhesive material is so important uh, and then it has been developed for a while. So the first report of bioadhesive right, uh, is on the fibrin node gene that's in 1940. And then following the innovation of cyanoacrylate, which is so famous, so nicely used, and has been known as the strongest bioadhesive available on the market. And in recent years, recent decades, right, there are many, many great innovations of different kind of biofeasive, including those very no, well-known work on the Jeff Cobb's lab, and also those based on the muscle-inspired material from the Master Smith's lab. And recently, uh, in recent kind of five years, uh, my lab and I also get in, into this area. So we have some kind of work recently published uh, on this domain. And what I want to show you in this slide, just to highlight some uh, uh, work is not meant to be kind of like including every. So for sure, there are many other great work on bioadhesive and you can find it uh, in the literature. And all those existing bioadhesives, they are very interesting uh, system based on hydrogels. So you, get, you will know that the hydrogel are a combination of the polymer and the water Right, due to this kind of like a uh, physical chemical property, hydrogel are known to resemble soft tissue pretty well because it containing a lot of water and it is soft and biocompatible. That just like qualify them as a good material system for uh, bioheaters. However, they are not great or they are not ideal for this bioheater application. The reason is very simple and has been widely recognized in the field for a long time, right? The hydrogel system containing a lot of water and those water actually do nothing, mostly nothing, right? In terms of the adhesion or their mechanical property. So in that case, we have done some early work to characterize the adhesion between the hydrogel on tissue or the hydrogel on elastomer. So this typically uh, very conventional hydrogel such as alginate or like PEG has a very, very low intrinsic adhesion on the biological tissue. So we measure that the adhesion energy is 0.1 joule per meter square. So here I'd like to introduce this kind of mechanical quantity 
a heat energy. So essentially, that is the mechanical energy you need to do, you need to contribute in order to detach a unit area of the cohesion. So higher this energy means you need to do more work in order to detach those adhesion. So in comparison, uh, the black plots or these commercially available uh, bioadhesive uh, can provide you the adhesion energy between like one to 10 joule per meter square. They are much better, right? Compared to these conventional hydrogels. However, they are much, much lower uh, if you comparing them with the biological tissue, right? The biological tissue containing different R and the adhesion between different ingredients, for example, such as like the cottage adhesion with the bone, or like different kind of substructure using the intervertebral disc, the adhesion energy is much, much higher, right? So they are on the order of like 10 per meter square. As you can appreciate here, you have like two or three order magnitude of gap in order right to to to, to uh to match so how we can address this challenging uh with the bioadhesion so that is one of the main focus of my lab at McGill so for today's talk I will try my best to illustrating the solution for those three listed questions with our recent work from our own lab. The first question I try to address is why bioadhesion is challenging, right? Why it's difficult to achieve a tough and strong bioadhesion in the first place. And then I will show you our design, our strategy to form a tough bioadhesion. And later on, I will show you how we can translate this kind of new bioadhesive in the biomedical application. So in this slide, I kind of associated some of our recent work uh, with each question. Uh, and if you're interested, I welcome to, to take a look. And then I was starting with the first question. Why bioadhesion is challenging? So bioadhesion always involves the biological system. And those biological tissue are complex in chemistry, in physics, in mechanics. So as you can see from the Kind of schematic I show here, uh, the biological tissue such as the skin are covered with the sweat and it can be exposed to body fluids such as blood. And at the same time, right, it's then a subject to mechanical loading. And those kind of complex mechanical loading be even more demanding for those kind of tissue within our human body, right, such as cartilage, such as tendon or meniscus. In those kind of like tissue surface and tissue environment, the formation of bioadhesion can be interfered by those body fluids. And also, even though you form a adhesion, right, it is easy to delaminate or easy to rupture because of this demanding mechanical loading presented to tissue. And then how we can tackle this complex problem, right? So here, I just would like to introduce the governing equation underlying all our discovery and innovation. So this governing equation is listed here. It's super simple. It's illustrating the mechanics of the bioadhesion in general. So here you want to detach an adhesive from a tissue. So this equation underlines illustrating the mechanical contributions of different parts within this mechanical system. Okay, so the total adhesion energy has three contributions. The first thing, it relates to the energy, right, you need to do in order to break the bond at the interface. And second part, you need to damage somewhat, right, some part within the tissue. And the third part, you will have some work to be done, or those energy will be dissipated by this adhesive matrix. Okay, so those three contributions come together, uh, define the adhesion energy or define the adhesion performance of a bioadhesive. And then let's do, dive into each contribution. The first one is called gamma zero. That is the intrinsic adhesion. So essentially that is the energy you need to break the bond at the interface. 
And that is closely related to different kind of chemistry people have developed, have explored. As you can see here, you can do different chemistry to build those kind of interfacial bonding between the adhesive and the tissue. And despite this variety of different chemistry, as you can appreciate from here, right, the chemical bonds are actually limited, right? Largely, uh, they are, will be categorized into like carbon nitrogen bonds or carbon carbon bonds, something like that. And for those kind of bonds, right, it has a physical limit of the bond energy. What is important, I will show you uh, by combining this called Lake Thomas model or Lake Thomas theory. So that is a theory in order to calculate this total amount of the work in order to break a bond on uh, interface, at the interface. So essentially, as you can appreciate from this equation, the intrinsic toughness scale with the bond energy, right? How strong is this each of those bonds? and also scale with the number of the density of those bonds at the interface. And what's specifically introduced by this theory is just that you're also scaling with the length of this chain located at the surface. Okay, so at the end of the day, you have this super elegant equation and you can put into different kind of representative number for, for each parameter. Right, so we have physical limits to packing the number of the chain on the surface. We have physical limits of those bond energy as just described. And then we have those typical length of those polymer chain, which allowed us to manipulate on the tissue surface. By putting all those kind of rep representative number, and you can see the gamma zero has a physical limit. So that only can give you on the order of 10 joule per meter square. Okay, so that is the first contribution. Unfortunately, we only have on the order of 10. And then come to the contributions of the tissue. The tissue is very complex, right? We have different kinds of tissue behave differently. So here, in order to study their contribution mechanically to an to a heating problem, so we need to rely on finite element simulation. Okay. So it's a highly nonlinear, complex mechanical problem. And the final element simulation allowed us to see how much work can be consumed by the tissue. So this work is done by my student. So Jen has to develop this kind of a very comprehensive final element model, and they can account for the mechanics of the different biological tissue, such as porcine skin, such as human aorta or the liver. And then also including like this kind of mechanical property of the hydrogen adhesive, I will show you in a minute. But the conclusion is very profound. The conclusion indicating not much energy is consumed by the tissue. So the contribution of the tissue as a result would be very small. As you can see from this simulation result, most of the energy are dissipated on the adhesive side. There are almost nothing right? There's no dissipation in the tissue site. So that is the conclusion we have found on the tissue contribution. And then we have the last part, right? It's the contribution of the adhesive. So here in this case study, I like to study, study the native bioadhesive we have in our body. When you have bleeding, that's the body Right, we're generating this blood clot, which is an uh, intrinsic or native bioadhesive we have to stop the bleeding, to adhere to the bleeding side, stop the blood flow. And here we have carried out this kind of biomechanics study by my student, and we reported, we presented the first report of this fracture toughness of the human blood clot. So this is a mechanical property quantify this energy dissipation within the black box as a native bioadhesive. And this kind of uh, result is pretty robust by changing different kind of testing method or testing uh, 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 geometry to give a very consistent uh, uh, toughness of the black clot. So in that case, we found that the toughness or the Black clot matrix contribution is also quite small. It's only contribute to one joule per meter square. 
And then you view some of all those things together in the case of black clock, right? So the change of companies on the order of 10, and then the contribution of the tissue is very manageable, and the black clot itself is pretty brittle. And the heat energy we got from the black clot is very small. So here, that is also consistent with the uh, uh, vivo result. That's a result from our collaborator uh, lab that's showing that black clot as a native biohazard form in the bleeding site, but is easy to kind of like a rupture, is easy to detach from the tissue. So because of the heat performance is limited. We also have other ongoing work to study specifically adhesion of the bio, uh, of the black clot, but we haven't published, so you can stay tuned for our other results. And then the other case study will be on the commercial bioadhesion. Why they are limited? We have talked about the first contribution, and then let's just check what's the contribution of this adhesive matrix of the commercial product. So we have measured the toughness of those commercial products, again, is pretty low. Is on the order of 10 to meter square. Again, if you sum up all those contributions, you will got around kind of 20 to meter square. And this estimation actually is pretty close to our measurement of adhesion of like cosy on the porcelain scheme. Let's measure that around 30. So that's just to show you, right? So explain the reason why these commercial bioheaters, they are very limited in terms of adhesion performance. And because of this weak adhesion performance, that also limits the application scope of such commercial bioheaters. So here I just show you this indication, there's a guidelines of a product called Duracell that is a hydrogen bioheater and then specifically mentioned that it only can be used as an adjunct to suture uh, uh, repair. And it cannot be used alone because of, as you can see here, the mechanical property of those commercial bioheaters are very, very limited. And then how we can do a better job. So we got some insight from this final element simulation. And that is illustrating in this result. So basically, right, we don't have much uh, space to further improve this gamma zero that only can get to on the order of like 10 to the square and the contribution of the tissue also predefined right and the only space we can play the only knot we can tune would be this adhesive matrix so that's final animal simulation result showing if we can make the adhesive matrix to be more dissipative it's more ready to dissipate energy and we are able to achieve a much higher overall each energy just show that if you're by using a tougher adhesive matrix, we can easily enhance the adhesion performance. For example, in this case, from like uh, 28 to 60. So that is a pure computational study. And then we have our experimental result and material system to show this methodology work. So that is the work we published in Science in 2017 they're reporting this kind of first generation of this tough bioadhesive uh, can achieve on different kind of like biological uh, tissue. So here is a picture just to illustrate uh, give you this impression of how this bioadhesive uh, can perform. You can attach to this porcelain heart and they can stretch to large stretch ratio without detachment. And what's the trick to design such tough adhesive. So again, they got the insight from this kind of governing equation, right? So first thing we need to do, we need to build up a good interface. So we need to build this good or reasonable intrinsic adhesion, gamma zero, between this adhesive matrix with the tissue. And the material system we show here is like we use a chitosan. And chitosan, as you may know, is a polysaccharide derived from the stream shell, and it has a very unique uh, molecular structure. It's carrying this priming amine group, and this priming amine group at the neutral pH, because of their pKa, it will become protonated, so it's positively charged. 
So it gives a big advantage of this polymer to building this interfacial bond with the tissue. First of all, it's positive charge. It can kind of like absorb electrostatically to the negatively charged tissue surface, right? All those different kinds of protein in the cell membrane. And then we can have uh, easily form a covalent bond with the protein such as collagen. Because we have this polymer amine, it can easily form a amine bond with the carbon acid of the protein through this carbon element chemistry. And at the same time, at the interface, this polymer doesn't work as an individual linker or kind of like molecule. It will assemble it together because it can form this kind of hydrogen bond with themselves. And this kind of like interconnected uh, network at the interface will be maximized the capacity to really bridge the adhesive matrix and the tissue together. And then we engineer the adhesive matrix. So adhesive matrix, we need to maximize its capacity to dissipate mechanical energy. So the, the material system we use here is the top hydrogel containing alginate and polyacrylamide. So that is a very well-recognized work from, uh, 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 from Harvard. They use this specific combination of the polymer that created a double network or interpenetrating uh, network hydrogel, which can dissipate a lot of mechanical energy. So here, in those schematics are to illustrating Right. If you're using a single network conventional hydrogel, you only can dissipate a small amount of mechanical energy because you only need to damage a very small region of the material. By using the combination, you need to damage a large area, large volume of this hydrogel. So therefore, sum up together will lead you to a high toughness. And this kind of combination of the network also kind of coincide with those kind of protein work, you can find it from the uh, mucus secreted by the, uh, a slab. So it's containing both uh, ionic and the covalent crossing network. And then we just show that by combining these two ingredients together, we can make a, a, a very uh, a tough uh, adhesive and we achieve the adhesion energy will be larger than 1000 joule per meter squared. And then also further data to supporting this combination, the synergy between interfacial bonding and the bulk toughness, bulk dissipation is very, very important to achieve such high adhesion performance. And this adhesion performance is much higher compared to the cyanoacrylate and COSIO, as well as other kind of bioadhesive under development. And what's also important is facilitate the application is is we can achieve uh, a good bioadhesion within a certain amount of time. So this kind of adhesion kinetic study, we show that we achieve more than 200 jumping square within one minute. So this performance itself already much higher than the fiber glue or the, or the T-cell used in the market. And because of the chemistry we use is carbon dimer chemistry, uh, and then it's mainly focused on the protein and we can apply our adhesive universally on different kinds of tissue. So here, this is another result by screening different kinds of biological tissue, and we all achieve a very high adhesion energy. And then I'd like to quickly show a demonstration, like uh, in an uh, in vivo case. So we have uh, uh, opening the chest of a living uh, pig, and then we have this kind of beating heart, and just like to consider the effect of the blood, and we also kind of predispose the surface with the blood. And after some compression uh, for like uh, one or two minutes, and we can achieve the top adhesion between this kind of adhesive hydrogel and the hot surface. So just notice it's only this region on the left receive the compression and form the adhesion. As you can appreciate here, the adhesion is pretty robust. This uh, independent of this kind of beating movement of the tissue surface. And then this adhesive itself is also super tough. And the overall performance, as I show on the left, will be independent of the blood exposure. In the comparison, is like sunlight clay is very sensitive to 
water moisture. So if you have uh, some liquid applied on a blood exposed surface, the adhesion will be much, much lower compared to the dry surface. And, and this performance is summarized in this kind of uh, result. We achieve a very tough and adhesive uh, at the same time. And this performance uh, uh, in terms of the adhesion is comparable to adhesion between the cartilage and the bone. And then the, often the question I receive from the audience would be, OK, so you receive so much high tough uh, adhesion, but how you can control that? Another critique people can have is carbon dimer chemistry is known to be toxic to cell, and how we can kind of get rid of it uh, in order to form a tough bioadhesion uh, uh, steel. So that is the question which my students and we are also working on, uh, and it's not an easy question. And then we need a special tool. So this tool is special for the biofuture field, but it's kind of widely used in the clinic as well, is the ultrasound. So here we developed this new technique uh, by leveraging the low frequency ultrasound. And then we just show the magic. You can form the tough bioadhesion while you don't need to do any chemical bonding at the interface. So the overall schematic is uh, or the overall procedure illustrating here, right? If uh, you you apply this hydrogen bridging polymer on the on the surface, and the previous way we need to rely on the EDC chemistry in order to form the covalent bond, and uh, because right, this polymer cannot penetrate into the tissue uh, due to the barrier effect of the skin, and then by leveraging this ultrasound uh, technique and we can generate a lot of micro bubble and this micro bubble will cavitate the chitosine solution and then it will propel this chitosine polymer chain penetrate into the tissue substrate and following the application of this hydrogel uh, this kind of approach allows us to form a tough bio adhesion without using carbon dynamic chemistry. So that is the experiment we have done, and that is the work recently accepted to science, and we can show there's a big contrast uh, between the adhesion performance with and without applying the ultrasound. And we further study the detailed mechanism for this, so that is the result showing under the ultrasound pro, we have this kind of cavitation effect, and this cavitation mechanism will uh, greatly promoting the penetration, the chitosan uh, bridging polymer into the tissue, and we can achieve a much higher penetration depth. And also we further show that this kind of cavitation event is nicely correlated with the adhesion performance we achieve. So with this result, we just show that right, by leveraging this ultrasound, we can really nicely and handily control the magnitude of those adhesion. And not only the magnitude of the bar adhesion, by applying the ultrasound on demand, we can control which locations of this bar adhesion form. So that is the result as a demonstration showing that it's only the region we see the ultrasound, we can form a tough bar adhesion. So that is the, the demonstration, right? We applying the ultrasound using the circle and it can form the adhesion. The other region even exposed to this bridging polymer because this bridging polymer cannot penetrate and it cannot form adhesion. The further demonstration to show in here, and we also conducted a numerical simulation to, to, to by modeling this cavitation effects on the tissue, and we can predict it, this adhesion area. Uh, so essentially we can control the gap between ultrasound pro and the tissue, and we can control precisely the region of this uh, bioadhesion formation. And the experiment and the result uh, agree pretty well. And this kind of methodology uh, has been demonstrated in the in vivo case. We demonstrated with red, and then by uh, nicely control the magnitude of this ultrasound, we just show this approach uh, induce uh, minimal inflammation in the tissue. 
And by combining with the drug delivery, we also show that not only achieving bioadhesion, we also can achieve transdermal drug delivery. Okay, so here would be my answers or my solutions for the second question. And then I'll use the rest time to illustrating how we can use this bioadhesive to tackle some clinical problem. So in my lab, we have working on different aspects of this clinical application, of our medical application. Due to time limit, I will mainly talk about the skin management, talk about the hemostatic uh, 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 technology, and also how to further integrate in this adhesive with other devices, such as surgical suture. And the first application we have been looking into is on the wound management, OK? So here, the story is following. We now can form a good adhesion with the skin and how we can leverage this adhesion form. So that's what proposed by uh, Serena uh, Black Low, now is a MDPC student in UCSF. So what we propose here is inspired by the biological phenomena. So this phenomenon is the contraction of the embryonic wound. So it has been known for the embryonic wound, you create a wound in the embryo and it can form this type of acting table structure, can shrink or zip up to the wound area. So that is a such nice efficient mechanism to accelerate the wound closure. Unfortunately, after the birth, this mechanism is lost for the human skin. And what we propose here is pretty simple, right? Since we can form a good adhesion, we just design this adhesive to be contracting, and therefore we can actively close the wound. So the mechanism we propose here is using a temperature-responsive hydrogen. And then we develop such a material by incorporating the poly nipont is a temperature responsive hydrogel into our adhesive matrix. And here we show that as embedded, right, this adhesive can contract at the body temperature. And then we have the full fund element toolbox to simulate this kind of transition process. At the same time, we also optimize the adhesion performance of this temperature responsive bioadhesive. We can achieve the adhesion performance by right, more than 100 dropping this way. And I kind of skipped some in vitro study. I just show you the in vivo result. So, this in vivo result testing is a skin wound model of mice. And we kind of show that the skin temperature of the mice are able to trigger this temperature condition. And this kind of like uh, adhesive can contact. And we see in three days, it can, it can substantially close the wound. And right within a week, it can close a large area of the wound. And it's much, much faster and compared to the tegatons, which is clinically used. So this kind of wound closure process is so fast. And the hypothesis, it should be independent. There's some biological process naturally, right, for wound regeneration. So it can be a mechanical biology uh, mechanism. So to show that, we also carry out this finite element simulation. Essentially, we can simulate the mechanics of the skin. We simulate this temperature transition behavior of this kind of like a bioadhesive. And we show that indeed, so that uh, can we, we can capture some of the wound contraction behavior of, of the uh, we observe in the animal study. And then we further kind of project it. This principle can be applicable for a human skin. And next, I also show the second application we have been focused is the hemorrhage. So hemorrhage is a critical clinical problem. And there are a large amount of the trauma that's actually no matter in the civilian or military setting are related to hemorrhage. So that is the important clinical problem calling for a new biomaterial solution. So that is so important, say, right, there's a platinum five minutes for this hemostatic management. We really need a good technology to stop the bleeding within five minutes in order to save lives. 
So that is a recent review paper we published. We kind of summarize the existing design principle for this hemostatic material, and we categorize it into two groups. One is biochemistry approach, another one is mechanical approach. The biochemical approach is the current gold standard, right, in the clinic, while the mechanical hemostatic is receiving interesting attention because right, it can be independent of the coagulation cascade. So just a simple idea, the clot, as I just showed you, is not tough enough, it's not strong enough, and that's the biomaterial, right, to reinforce or to replace the clot. And then you can attach to the tissue to stop the blood flow. However, right, so the bleeding phase, such as hemorrhage, would be very heavy. And there is a pressurized blood flow, and that won't be a simple blood exposure problem. And we need a good biomaterial strategy which can handle, right, such heavy bleeding phase. So here is another work done by my student. We have develop a second generation of this tough uh, bioadhesive by doing some kind of microengineering. So the motivation for such microstructure is to handle this pressurized blood flow and also to handle the case of all non-compressible hemorrhage. I just show you in the in vivo demonstration, we need to apply some compression to form the adhesion. Uh, but in the case of non-compressive hemorrhage, that's not applicable, that's not feasible. And how we can form a tough bar adhesion without applying compression. So that is the motivation for this kind of second generation of the bar adhesion. And we, our strategy is to design this microstructure, and this microstructure can do two things. First thing, in the case of the heavy bleeding, this microstructure, large pores can absorb the whole blood within the matrix. And therefore, right, it has, can form an intimate contact between the adhesive and the tissue. And further, by using this uh, chitosan based polymer matrix, we can also actively induce the clotting uh, within this adhesive matrix for better sealing effect. And by having this kind of porous structure, we have the capillary effects, uh, which allowed us to build up the adhesiveness without applying compression. So that is a very comprehensive result. My student we tested the adhesion on different kinds of tissue and elastomer with and without applying pressure. Uh, as you can appreciate here, for this material system, although the adhesion performance is not as high as the previous one, but the adhesive adhesion might uh, typically allow 100 dropping square, but importantly, it doesn't need the compression to, to build up the adhesion. Okay. Uh, and then that would be kind of a nice feature attribute for this non compressible hemorrhage condition. In those conditions, again, you have the heavy bleeding, you have this non compressible bleeding site. So to test flow, we have using both small and large animal model. So in this case, we use a rat model to a uh, liver uh, 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 punch uh, injury, and then we compare our uh, bioadhesive with the surgery form, uh, which is kind of like clinically used control. And we show that for our uh, bioadhesive, it can achieve much less blood loss and much quicker hemostasis. And at the same time, um, by analyzing the biocompatibility, we're showing our bioadhesive has a better kind of biocompatibility in comparison to surgery flow uh, because of the reduced fibrosis and the immune response. And then we also test it with another kind of injury by doing incisions on the liver. And here we compare with other uh, a commercial product, including the gauze and the compact gauze used in the battlefield. And we show that for our bioadhesive achieve a much, much less blood loss in comparison. So that is a very uh, promising result. Further motivated to test this large animal model, uh, collaborating with the Christian test shop from UBC. And we show that uh, for our new microstructural bioadhesive uh, can uh, achieve a very consistent, uh, good performance in terms 
of reducing blood loss compared to goals. The last piece of the story, I will quickly show you like, what additional dimension of this kind of adhesive technology can do uh, beyond by using itself as a material alone, we can further integrate it with the other biomedical tool or biomedical devices such as surgical suture. So why it is important? Because arguably suture would be still inevitable for many kind of surgical settings because the suture can provide the high tensile strength. It's on the order of one gigapascal much, much higher than any soft material, including the hydrogel or hydrogel-based bioheaser. And the suture already is clinically used, and right, there's a huge market for that. And that is just a summarize of the history, also the significant use of the surgical suture. And then how we can combine these two technologies together to enable new possibilities. So that question is addressed by our work, uh, and they have a very simple design. So how about we can code in the suture with our biohesive? And then in this case, since our adhesive is very tough and very robust, and you can nicely integrate it with the suture, and that is important because as you can appreciate it, suturing process involving a lot of mechanical shear, so therefore, we need this kind of robust hydrogels in order to survive in the suturing and right to, to be compatible with the existing procedure. And this strategy, we kind of like somewhat uh, 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 mimic this kind of uh, structure of the tendon. And then it's applicable for different kind of suture. We have demonstrated for the biodegradable suture uh, PRGA and also like the plain gut, as well as by apply applicable with the non degradable sutures such as nylon. And what's the benefit to have this robust coding on suture? So here we are we demonstrated they will bring a lot of benefit in terms of biomechanical performance. And the premier would be we won't sacrifice the tensile property of the suture. So they can show it by this result here in terms of the tensile, it will be the same. But at the same time, we can dramatically reduce the surface thickness of the suture. We reduce it from 70 megapascal to 7 kilopascal because of this very soft gel coating. And then due to this soft gel coating, we can also reduce dramatically the frictions of the suture right on the cotton surface. It is relevant in the case of the cotton repair because the clinically evidence showing by applying the crystal suture on the cottage, you can scratch it like the, the, the counter tissue surface, the, the meniscus or, or the other, other side of the, 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 the body. So in this case, that is the real benefits of this gel coating. And at the same time, we also have some interesting results in vivo by doing this kind of subcutaneous implantation, including this gel coating. We can reduce this kind of inflammation of the degradable uh, PGS, uh, degradable suture uh, in vivo. So, and then further, by having this kind of gel coating, we can use it as a platform to encapsulate different kinds of functional material to make a smart suture. So that's just like a simple demonstration. We show that by including a pH sensing B, we can have the pH sensing suture. Uh, it is relevant for the wound management because the wound bed can have different pH level. And by having this suture naturally presented to the wound site, and by checking the color visually, you can tell uh, uh, the infection condition or what's the healing process of the skin wound. And by incorporating some kind of nanoparticle, we even can enable the bioimaging of this kind of suture inside the, the, the human body under the skin. Okay, so that's all. Uh, I think we can go, uh, hopefully, I can show you the overview of our research effort. So, we are a lab located at McGill. 
uh, we tried to synergize different kind of like uh, approach, material, chemistry, physics, mechanics to create new biomaterial to solve a biomedical problem. And then uh, our research a few different disciplines and hopefully we can make more of this kind of biomaterial can impact the surgery and impacts the healthcare. So that's all. Uh, thank you so much for your attention and welcome. Well, welcome. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Professor Li, for your fantastic talk. Uh, so yeah. uh, I, I hope uh, the audience also enjoyed as much as I enjoyed your presentation. It was uh, it was very inspiring uh, and and, uh, and 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 very interesting technology you've developed for the past few uh, few years. Uh, congratulations. Uh, yeah, uh, so you. I just wanted to remind everyone that uh, our uh, next speaker uh, uh, is, is Professor Jared Cherko. Uh, make sure that you follow us on, on Twitter, our uh, handle is Transel BME, um, and then you can get uh, most up to date information uh, for the upcoming talks uh, uh, by following us on Twitter. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, make sure that you ask uh, the question uh, using the ask the question box and uh, you can also share your thoughts uh, with, with with our speaker uh, using the chat box uh, uh, as Mike Barton did uh, so yeah so that that uh, ultrasound technology is, is pretty cool and I really, uh, I really enjoyed it uh, so so uh, just a quick question uh, about that uh, ultrasound technology uh, so it provides a specificity which is which is very nice uh, how fast it activates the, uh, the, the bioadhesive. Hmm. Okay, so, so the ultrasound is a very cool technology. It has been, has been a, a developed and widely used. So the user can easily tune the intensity of ultrasound and also tune the time. And as we have investigated, the effect of ultrasound, right, will be scaled proportional to the intensity, also the time it is applied. So therefore, right, if you apply a high intensity, uh, we can form the adhesion in a shorter, shorter time. Uh, and then like the, uh, the yeah, if the lower lower intensity you can can, can yeah you need a longer time to apply. And we also could have to apply the ultrasound within like uh, 30 seconds. And mm -hmm. that would be generally Kind of quick enough, uh, and able to perform Wonderful. Well, so that's that's great. But uh, like the, the the next question is about. So I noticed that this this ultrasound technology is good for for external bleedings. Uh, uh, yes. It's very clear. Uh, do you can you comment on the application for internal uh, managing internal bleeding as well? Do you see uh, any any application in that uh, space as well? Right. So. For the internal uh, application, right, we are uh, interesting about, right, for example, involve some kind of open surgery, uh, and then you can apply this small ultrasound pro, for example, right, attach this kind of implantable device on like the hard surface or like the inner surface of the uh, abdomen space. So, so th those can be done, involve the, the open surgery. And it also can be very interesting. There's something we are very interested about. There are technique called focus ultrasound. So there are other existing ultrasound technology, which as you can see is for the bioimaging. Those are non-invasive. So it's in those cases can also combine with the, some injection of some material and applied ultrasound outside the body. And that, that can be used to anchor and attach some kind of devices inside the body. Uh, so, but for the first work we have demonstrated is maybe to, to showcase this possibility of combining yeah. ultrasound uh, with biology yeah. and that will be enable a new capacity. Yeah, but yeah, one more, more thing I'll be looking forward and also, yeah. yeah. Okay, no, that's really cool. That's really cool. And, and then, then uh, I think Michael has a, a follow-up question. Uh, are you yeah. looking into bioabsorbable hydrogel? Um, uh, you know, I mean, you can read the question actually and then, then, then yes. uh, probably. Yes, so the hydrogel uh, uh, clearly right, uh, can be designed to be bioabsorbable, and there are already a lot of effort uh, for, uh, following up and existing in the field. So, for example, in this case, 
uh, we can use the uh, yeah in our system uh, we can use oxidized arsenic which can has a faster degradation rate and in terms of the polyacrylamide uh, matrix we can replace it with other other polymer work or we can using a uh, degradable cross linker such as like UGDA which is slowly degrading or using gamma has been demonstrated very nicely actually there's a work from uh, David Mooney at Harvard they are they already kind of addressed this question uh, by having mm -hmm. the file a double hydrogen in the case of this kind of like a uh, hemostatic biodiesel I show with a lot of microstructure and that one mm -hmm. is bioassorbable. So we are intentionally mm -hmm. uh, use this kind of degradable network uh, because it's relevant, right? For the leading case, like you don't want to remove the the hemostats from the, the, the bleeding sites. So we mm -hmm. have designed this to be uh, biodegradable uh, by using this kind of oxidized hydrogen and also using a degradable uh, polymer uh, network. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, very cool. Very cool. Uh, so uh, my next question is, uh, you already addressed my like, yep. question about degradation. Uh, so uh, so I'll just have uh, one more question, about, about, but, but it's, it's going to be around uh, about the, uh, the numerical modeling that you use. Yep. Uh, pretty cool stuff. Uh, so, uh, so what kind of assumptions did you use to simplify the model? Yes, so, so it's a very complex problem. Clearly, you are right. We need to simplify the, the, the problem. Like clearly, big assumption as I show for all our simulation, we are doing kind of like 2D simulation. So we don't do a 3D simulation. And that, that should be a pretty safe one. And then the other assumption we have done uh, is to we, we simplify uh, the mechanics of the hydrogen we, we use. Mm -hmm. So for example, we are making account for the large deformation behavior. However, we don't account for the effect of the water. So there are some mm. nice mechanics work from the like Rui Huang group in Texas showing the migration of the water uh, mm. in terms of the power electricity also mm -hmm. affecting the fracture behavior of those hydrogen. I mean, it should be the same for this hydrogen biodiesel. But this part, mm. we, are, we are neglected. Another big part mm -hmm. we are neglecting would be the viscoelasticity of the hydrogen. Mm -hmm. We account mm -hmm. for the energy dissipation, uh, mm -hmm. but it's only the rate independent uh, uh, mm -hmm. process, essentially mm -hmm. fraction. However, mm -hmm. for the hydrogen kind of use, as you can most everyone appreciate it, is viscoelastic. There are a lot of yeah. involvement and, and those rate dependence yeah. uh, phenomena will be super complex uh, to, to including in our simulation, yeah. uh, so so that that is the big assumption we do, and what we present in terms of the simulation would be kind of simulating the the slow rate process. So basically, it doesn't account for the big kind of uh, viscoelastic effects. Yeah, so that uh, that's, that's reasonable. It's it's very complicated. Yeah, I mean, I mean model, and then I mean, it's. Uh, and, uh, I mean, as long as it does the job and then answers the questions, then, then it should be fine. Uh, so, Zhang, Zhang Yi, I hope I pronounce your name properly. Uh, at, in the last project, you mentioned using near infrared fluorescent nanoparticles to measure D tissue penetration capability. Could you please provide more detail about that? So, that's about. Yeah, yeah so, so, so for the detail, uh, you, can, you can refer to the paper we do. And the essential idea is like we have this kind of nanoparticle containing the quantum dots, and that will respond to to uh, near infrared, so it can emit near infrared light. So the nice thing about our hydrogel system is it is transparent to the emission of those nanoparticles, and then therefore it provides a transparent, very clean background to holding those nanoparticles to the suit. And then also like right, located outside the suture. So therefore, compared to the other strategy in terms of engineering the suture, they need to load it, those nanoparticles can cool it inside this plastic. Uh, our our design is much simpler and elegant. And it works because you can write this near infrared light would be penetrates through the tissue. But what we have demonstrated here uh, is more kind of proof of concept and it is relevant. Uh, 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 just like uh, 
in the case of like you have this under skin, but however, right, uh, we do uh, encounter uh, limitations such as it cannot penetrate too deep. So basically you have the inside the, the brain, right, they are much deeper and you have the, the skull, there's a bone, which doesn't allow the NRI to penetrate. So that, that is not uh, applicable, uh, but mm -hmm. But just like for for, for sub Q and, and for some uh, application, for example, inside the joint or the tendon, uh, the penetration depth we have damaged will be already ready for the clinical application. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, wonderful. This is this is great uh, uh, projects and great technology that you have developed, uh, Michael. Also, I mean, you can read his his comment as well. Uh, would be more uh, superficial, yeah. I think, much easier surgeon to control its application. Uh, so, uh, so if there are no more questions from the from the audience, I'd like to thank our speaker again. Uh, very interesting talk. Uh, I, I really enjoyed it uh, today, and then uh, uh, also I would like to thank the audience for participating in this uh, this uh, talk today. Uh, don't forget part your calendar for our next speaker, uh, Professor uh, Cherko. Uh, for, for next week, and, and then I wish you all a great day. Yeah, yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. Take care. All the great questions. Bye bye.